Thank you, Anoop. Hello, everyone. Blockchains present very novel opportunities for new applications, such as decentralized finance and for enabling cross-border micropayments. However, working with blockchains also presents unique challenges, both from a technical standpoint and from other standpoints, such as managing your cryptocurrency wallet private keys. Analyzing blockchain data can be cumbersome because of all the different data structures and things like that. And, but with the advent of large language models and generative AI agents, we can now start to address some of these challenges. And that's what we're going to do in this talk. My name is Emil Basil. I'm a senior Web3 architect at AWS, based out of New Hampshire. Let's get started. So today, we're going to be talking about two use cases. The first use case is using bedrock agents to analyze blockchain data. And the second use case is using bedrock agents as a decentralized finance assistant and using that to interact and transact on the blockchain. But to kick things off, I'll pass it over to my colleague, Simon, who will walk us through the first use case on analyzing blockchain data. Thank you very much, Emil. My name is Simon Goldberg, and I'm a Web3 Specialist Solutions Architect based out of Atlanta, Georgia. And as Emil said, we will first discuss bedrock agents for blockchain analysis. Emil and I built a solution that allows for text-to-SQL queries on the AWS public blockchain data sets for both Bitcoin and Ethereum. Back in 2022, these data sets were released under the Open Data Program, allowing for analysts to issue SQL queries using services such as Amazon Athena or Amazon Redshift in order to glean insights. One of the key benefits of these data sets is the ability to aggregate data across multiple different blockchain networks, such as Bitcoin and Ethereum. However, processing and analyzing this data still requires a comprehensive understanding of data schemas and the ability to construct appropriate SQL queries. With generative AI, you can now extend this analysis capability to support natural language queries, and this ultimately enables users who may not be familiar with SQL to gain similar insights from blockchain data. Let's discuss how the text-to-SQL bedrock agent works for this use case. It is really quite simple. In order to execute the agent, you first enter a prompt into a chat box such as, what is the largest Bitcoin transaction of all time? Based on this prompt, the agent generates and executes a SQL query using Amazon Athena and then returns a formatted response back to the user. You may be wondering how the agent understands the task at hand that it needs to accomplish. Let's discuss the process of how Emil and I built this agent. When we were building the data analyst agent, we essentially had to go through four main steps, and we really see this as a repeatable deployment pattern. The first step is creating your bedrock agent and selecting the appropriate large language model and configuring various parameters. In this, in this use case, we were utilizing the Claude Anthropic Haiku model due to there not being that much context embedded into the actual agent itself. After you create the agent, you can define the agent's behavior via the agent instruction, which is a prompt associated with the agent. We have a little excerpt of the instruction here, and I'll read it out loud real quick. It says, you are a SQL developer creating queries for Amazon Athena, Bitcoin, and Ethereum databases. If you receive an error from Athena, create another query to resolve the error message and try to run it again. The actual agent instruction is much more comprehensive than this short excerpt right here. But at the end of this presentation, we have a QR code that links to an open source repository in case you want to see the full instruction. We found that the agent instruction has a limited amount of characters. And if you really want to be sure the agent is going to do what you want it to do, Bedrock provides advanced prompts to add additional context. In the advanced prompt, we overrode the orchestration prompt, which is embedded in the agent. There's a couple of different advanced prompts, but you can really put extra context in here. And in this situation, we embedded the actual schemas for both our Bitcoin and Ethereum databases. For example, on Bitcoin, we have a schema representing blocks and transactions. And on Ethereum, we have six different tables 
uh, one example that Bitcoin doesn't have is token transfers and smart contracts, for example. After modifying the advanced orchestration prompt, we created an action group. And an action group is essentially how the agent can, can connect to backend functionality. And in this situation, the action group was defining APIs for invoking a very specific action. And in this case, it was taking in a SQL query as input, and it passes it to an associated Lambda function with the action group. And once the Lambda finishes running, it returns the response from the SQL query back to the agent such that it can be formatted in a human readable format. We briefly described the functionality here as well. It was very simple. We just wrote, execute this SQL query using Amazon Athena. And whenever the user enters in a prompt, the agent knows what to do and is able to construct and execute a SQL query, which we thought was pretty cool. Let's now take a look of a demo of this agent in action. You can see various prompts in the response that was returned here. For example, you can ask what the largest Bitcoin transaction was in the last 24 hours, or how many Ethereum contracts were created last week, or how many USDC transfers were there yesterday. Or what was the largest USDC transfer this month? You can even ask interesting questions like, what was the most expensive Ethereum transaction this year? And in each of these prompts, the agent understands the user's intent, constructs an appropriate SQL query, and then it gets executed on Amazon Athena and returned back to the agent. Let's briefly take a look at the architecture diagram so you can see in more detail how we built out this solution. As you can see in the top middle, you have a user who enters a prompt into the chat box, such as, what was the largest Bitcoin transaction ever? The agent takes the prompt and understands the user's intent. And based on the question that is asked, it knows what blockchain to query. For example, if I ask a question about smart contracts, the agent automatically will utilize the Ethereum blockchain due to Bitcoin not having native smart contract support. Once the Bedrock agent understands the user's intent, it can generate a SQL query, which gets passed to that action group, which is associated with an, a very simple AWS Lambda function, where it parses out the generated query from the input and executes it on Amazon Athena, which is run on our AWS public blockchain data sets and Amazon S3. We currently support Bitcoin and Ethereum, but we have five new chains coming out this week. so that this solution can be extended to that as well. In the case of there being an error, the error handling technique we implemented where the error, sorry, the agent takes in the error message and like really understands what went wrong, like based on that error message, it can try again to construct another query. And we found that to be a really useful mechanism for recovering from failures. And it was a very like naive approach as well, but it was super fantastic as Emil and I had to manually edit the agent instruction before. But adding that in to the top of the instruction, as you saw a few slides ago, like really fixed the overall functionality of the solution. We'll now discuss a couple key learnings we learned from building out this Bedrock agent for text to sql We interestingly found out that LLMs are inherently aware of many popular tokens and smart contracts. For example, when you pass in a popular token by name, such as the stablecoin USDC, the agent autonomously knows the associated smart contract address without the user having to specify it. We also found that agents can automatically convert hexadecimal values in Bitcoin blocks to readable text, which we thought was pretty cool. And going back to that error handling technique, I'm just going to re-emphasize that once again, because we found it to be the most effective way to handle errors and exceptions when querying blockchain data and preventing failures. One last learning is that when running a query, you have to scan a lot of data, and there's an associated cost with that. For example, when getting a Bitcoin balance, you have to scan 1.15 terabytes of data. And last year, we launched a service called Amazon Managed Blockchain Query, which has indexed data with millisecond latency and associated cost of $7 per million request, which can be a much more cost-efficient solution, depending on the use case. And with that, I'll pass this back to Emil so we can take a look at agents that interact with the blockchain.
Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Simon. So now we'll look at how we can interact with blockchain using a bedrock agent. Now I want to start us off with a quote from Brian Armstrong, CEO of Coinbase. I'll read the quote. It says, LLMs should have crypto wallets. Let's help AI agents get work done on your behalf and participate in the economy. So we drew inspiration from this quote and we set out to build a bedrock agent that can help us being a decentralized finance assistant. And we chose DeFi because DeFi is a very large ecosystem within blockchains, over $100 billion within there, continually growing. But the question is, what did we want to do with this DeFi assistant? And we, we kind of narrowed it down to three areas where we want it to help us with. The first is we want it to help us do research. So research on-chain decentralized finance opportunities. So find out from on-chain what are the lending rates, how much can I get if I want to, if I want to deposit some assets, how much do I have to pay if I want to uh, borrow those assets, suggest some trading and investment strategies, and also gather data from off-chain. So being able to do on-chain and off-chain market research. So that'll help inform a trading decision. But then we want the DeFi system to actually trade on our behalf. So we want to enable it uh, securely to manage our crypto wallet. So if we say, hey, we want to actually conduct this transaction, it can go and manage our, uh, our wallet private key for us on our behalf and execute a transaction. And the last thing we want to have it do is protect the user. So there's a lot of threats within decentralized finance. A lot of uh, protocols come under fire, come under attack. And we want to make sure that the user is not interacting with a protocol that's under any active threat at any moment. And I'm going to be walking through each of these three things and how we built the agent to uh, address each of these. To start things off, just to give you a context of what this agent interaction looks like, this is a text-based interface. We use Streamlit. And the reason we use Streamlit is, uh, there are several reasons, but the main one really is it allows a user to authenticate. And that's something which is going to be very important, as we'll see uh, in a few slides from now. So let's start with research. So on the left here, we're asking it questions such as, what are the current lending rates on chain? How much liquidity is in the USDC st uh, stablecoin pool? And the way this query gets processed is the prompt goes into the agent, which is that green box there. And we've equipped the agent with several uh, action groups. And in this case, we have an action group called a lending rate. And this action group is a Lambda function. We've equipped it with a SDK that can connect to the blockchain and query that data directly from the blockchain. And on the back end, we use Amazon Managed Blockchain for the RPC access to uh, the Ethereum network. So let's see what the prompts are in the responses. So these are some of the questions which you ask. What are the current lending rates? And it returns USDC is 7.6, DAI stablecoin 6.02, and it goes on down the list. How much liquidity is in the pool? At the time we created this, there was uh, $1.5 billion. More questions you can ask about it, how much has been borrowed. All these things which can help inform our trading uh, decisions here. The borrowing rate, the loan to value, to make sure we're in a healthy position, all of these things. So that's the research. Now let's move over to the trading. So say we found an investment opportunity that sounds great, we want to invest. First we want to find out maybe what our balance is. So we ask the agent, hey, how much USDC do I have in my wallet? What is my USDC balance? We get the response, we say, okay, great, I want to deposit $5 of USDC into the USDC lending market. Again, it's the same agent, but now it has another action group called the wallet management group. It's a Lambda function. And what this Lambda function does is it constructs an Ethereum transaction and it sends it to KMS to sign that transaction. And we use KMS because KMS is where we are storing our Ethereum wallet. So KMS natively supports the elliptic curve uh, cryptography that, that Ethereum uses. But if we wanted to support a different blockchain, for example, Solana, which uses a signature scheme that's not natively supported by KMS, or if we wanted to do this at scale and to build a more cost-effective solution, we could introduce a different wallet uh, structure, for example, using AWS Nitro Enclaves, which are confidential computing environments uh, carved out inside of an EC2 instance that are protected from even operator access 
to that, to that environment. And within the Enclave, we will generate the private keys, we will sign transactions, but the keys never leave the Enclave. We encrypt the key with KMS and we store it in low cost storage like DynamoDB or Secrets Manager or something else like that. For our solution, we use KMS. Now, if you're wondering, you might be wondering, well, how does the agent know which user to get the wallet for, right? And that's where this feature of session attributes comes into play. So session attributes, you can think of it as key value pairs, which we pass in to every invocation request to the agent. And these key value pairs propagate all the way down to the action group itself. And specifically in this case, the user is authenticating with Amazon Cognito. We've put some custom attributes in Cognito on the user that says this user has this wallet ID or AWS KMS key ID. So once the user authenticates, they get a JSON web token. That's a JWT on the end there. And we pass that along via the session attribute. So by the time the request reaches the action group, the Lambda function knows who the user is, what the key values are for their session attributes, and importantly, what their wallet ID is. So it knows which KMS key to go and request a signature from there. Oh, so walking through the prompts, what is my USDC balance? You currently hold $10 of USDC. We say we want to deposit $5 of USDC into the USDC lending market. It confirms exactly what it is that we want to do. And we say yes, and then it says, okay, I will prepare that transaction. So the last area that we want to look at is protection. So how do we protect the user here? So in the right here, we've introduced a Amazon Bedrock knowledge base. And this knowledge base is an up-to-date repository of all the known security threats that have, been, um, that have been announced on decentralized finance protocols. And we're continually uh, monitoring this data, pulling it down, and adding it to the knowledge base here. And we've connected it to our agent with an instruction that says, use this knowledge base to understand if there's any active security threats. And we've appended the instruction to the agent to say, before trading on a protocol, find out if there's been active threats. If so, do not trade on that. So the question is, how do we get data into the knowledge base? So what we're doing in the top right, we have off-chain data sources. These can be um, anything from financial news, sources, it could be the Telegram or Discord groups of the DeFi protocols which we're uh, interfacing with. And we have a Fargate cluster that's continually monitoring these, these data sources and dropping that information into an S3 bucket. And we have uh, an open search serverless database for converting all of, the, uh, all of the data that we've put in S3 into vector embeddings, which the knowledge base can then use. So that's how we get off-chain data into our knowledge base. And that's how we can help protect the user. With an example here, we want to, I, I just, I left out the name of the lending protocol, but deposit $5 into the lending protocol. Two days ago, there was a security breach, therefore I will not deposit. But we can override this if we want, right? So say, for example, we know that that's not an actual threat or it's not an active threat anymore. We can ask it more about it. It tells us more about the information. And then we can say, I'm aware of this, please continue. So there's a lot of ways you can um, use that to protect the user, but also um, not have it block the user from continuing on that if they would like. My favorite leadership principle at Amazon is thinking big, because it always forces me to think beyond just the problem that I'm working on. So some ways that we could expand what we've built here is looking at multi-party wallets. So instead of having just one key in KMS, you could imagine you have a key that's split up into three, three different shards. You have different parties holding different shards, and you bring them together. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer payments, so not doing DeFi at all, but just being able to say, hey, pay Simon $5. It knows what Simon's wallet address is, things like that. LLM-powered gaming assistant, uh, several other things there. Lastly, I'll leave you with this. Uh, this is the blog post and associated GitHub repo for uh, what Simon was presenting on analyzing blockchain data, if you're interested in learning more about that. And with that, thank you all for your time, and thank please you. Uh, complete the session survey in the mobile app. Thank you.